beautiful. It looks like we have coast to, to coast covered and uh, north, south, east, and west. So welcome wherever you are joining from. And we are so glad you are here today. Um, this is actually our first webinar in what is going to be a series related to the Weather Ready Research Award Program. And it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you this morning to this webinar. My name is Lori Peak, and I serve as the director of the Natural Hazard Center here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And again, we are so happy to welcome our presenters as well as our audience members this morning. And we wanna start out by giving great thanks to our partners at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA, as well as at the National Science Foundation, who have not only uh, funded this award program, but have also, as you're going to hear this morning, really helped to advance it and make it possible through um, sharing a, a vision for advancing weather ready research and training and mentoring a diverse next generation of weather, weather ready researchers. And so in addition to op uh, opening up this morning by welcoming all of you here, part of my job is to provide an overview for how we are going to proceed with the webinar today. So first, please know that the webinar is being recorded and that we will post this full 90 minute webinar to the webinar page for um, this particular program on the Natural Hazard Center website. So you'll be able to find this long after we adjourn today in uh, at the uh, at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time. And so how we're going to proceed today is in a moment, you're going to hear from Dr. Gina Iesco, who I see is on here and we are so excited to hear from. She serves as the social science as well as the facets or forecasting a continuum of environmental Threats program manager at NOAA. And she and her really extraordinary team at NOAA have played an integral role in terms of advancing a vision that is centered around supporting social, behavioral, and economic sciences research, as well as interdisciplinary research focused on advancing the weather enterprise. Gina and her team also share a deep commitment to really, again, training and mentoring a diverse next generation of researchers and to developing a, a cadre of researchers who are ready to collect perishable data immediately before, during, and after an extreme weather event, but also not to just collect that data, as we're going to hear about through this, the progression of this award program, also to ensure that the data that is collected is curated, published, and shared with a wider research community. So we're really excited to hear from Gina shortly. Then we will hear from Dr. Jennifer Tobin, who is the Deputy Administrator of the Natural Hazard Center and has helped to advance this entire effort. So she's gonna talk to us about the um, different awards that were funded during round one of the Weather Ready Research Award Program and will point us to the extraordinary set of reports that have been produced thus far. And so without further ado, uh, I'll end where I began with a great uh, welcome to each of you, a thanks in advance to our presenters. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Gina. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Lori. It's always a, a pleasure to, to be here with you and you always do such a nice job setting the stage. So thank you for, for organizing this and to Jennifer as well. And for all of you for attending, you are what is making all of this possible. And I, I am just um, incredibly grateful and thankful for your commitment um, to this work. As Lori says, the, the Weather Ready Research Program uh, uh, sort of came about for a variety of reasons. One, we also, uh, as an agency, believe in collecting perishable data. And as you can imagine, within the weather context, there are many events uh, that uh, occur that we wish we could know more about. Uh, did we communicate well? Did they have access to the products? Did they have access to resources to respond? Uh, were we clear, right? So, so many different questions. And without the wonderful research community on the ground, um, we don't have answers. And so um, that aspect of perishable data is extraordinarily important to us. Another avenue of importance to us is the area of data publication, data and instrument, excuse me, I should have said that together first, data and instrument publication. 
One is to make sure you all get credit for the really excellent work that you are doing, not just within journal publications, but also with the data you're creating and the insights you're creating through excellent instruments. One of the reasons for this emphasis from our perspective is we have a lot of physical science partners, practitioners that need instruments uh, to assess internal mechanisms or to assess partnerships and having access to incredibly valid and reliable measures is an important feature of that. And what's equally important to me is giving attribution to the folks who created that expertise and that is all of you. On the data side, uh, there is uh, a really big mission around data uh, within our agency. I should say human impact data or social science data as we sometimes describe it. Um, our mission within the weather context is to save lives, protect property and enhance the national economy. And in my heart, I know that we do that. Explicitly though, it is hard to measure. Um, and without good data, we can't uh, provide the economic valuation or the product and service valuation or evaluation in that case, um, or conduct meta analyses of what we know without access to data. And again, being a big believer in attribution, wanting to encourage data publication so that you, the amazing community that collected that work can get uh, the DOI and the credit. Uh, we can begin tracking uh, citations of data. And so with that, we are just delighted to partner with the Natural Hazard Center. Um, their resources and the community they've built is, there's just no one better. <laughs> and so uh, we are delighted to partner with them. And again, I want to express my deep appreciation um, for all of you that have participated in the calls, all of you that are listening in today, uh, for people that have participated, those who want to participate, all of you, we're just so deeply grateful to have such a diverse community uh, looking at these subjects. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Lori. Gina, thank you so much for that. And thank you for the, the support of this first round that we're going to hear about today, as you alluded to the second round, which is really emphasize the data publication and data sharing. And we will use this as an opportunity too to make sure that we promote that we have this third round, again, thanks to the partnership of NOAA and NSF that's currently available to support the tornado ready research with uh, NOAA's leadership. And so again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for those uh, wise and warm words. And now I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer, who's going to give us sort of a deeper dive into this first round of Funny Call and um, help to preview the nine presentations that we are so excited to hear today. Thank you, Jen, over to you. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, Gina, so much. And as well as um, thank you for the support from the entire NOAA team, Castle and Kim and everybody involved have been so wonderful through this whole process and through all of the three special calls we currently have going. Um, and so now it is my pleasure to introduce to you the research that will be presented today on the first special call. And so the first special call for proposals for weather ready research was funded in February of 2021 with an emphasis on how the public receives, interprets and responds to high impact weather information. And so today you'll hear from nine research teams that were funded as part of this special call. And as Lori mentioned earlier, uh, full reports for completed projects can be found on the Natural Hazards um, Center website and forthcoming reports will be posted very soon. Um, so Katie, thank you so much for adding that link to the chat box so people can check out the reports in full. Um, so one member from each team today will have seven minutes to present their research. And as we move through the presentations, I would ask the audience to please leave your comments in the chat box. Um, and once everybody has finished presenting, we will open it up for questions and have plenty of time for discussion with the presenters and the audience members. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce our for first presenter, uh, Jennifer First from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville will be presenting on examining public response and climate conditions during overlapping tornado and flash flood warnings. So Jennifer, feel free to share your screens and get your screen and get going. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. Get my slides going. Excellent. Um, thank you um, again. Uh, just want to acknowledge my co-authors on uh, our report. Uh, we're really excited to share with you our findings. Um, so acknowledging uh, Dr. Kelsey Ellis at University of Tennessee and also Dr. Stephen Strader at Villanova University. Um, so just to say a little bit about um, what we were looking at in terms of what our project was focused on, um, we examined concurrent tornado and flash flood warnings. These events are known as uh, TORF events. 
Um, and as we know, severe weather can often include multiple hazard uh, threats, including simultaneous tornadoes and flash flood threats. Um, and these happen approximately about 400 times per year within the United States. Um, and the National Weather Service issues these concurrent tornado um, and flash flood warnings in, in, in a given area. These events are known as potential dwarfs. Um, and that map that you can see in front of you, figure one, uh, shows the location of potential TORF events that have been issued actually last year from January 1st through December 16th. And so looking at that map, we can see that these dual warnings occur most frequently in the South Central Missouri and the Lower Mississippi River Valley. Um, for the public that are receiving these warnings, these warning protocols can be really challenging, um, particularly because the recommended protective actions for these two hazards can be seen as contradictory. So getting a tornado warning, um, the recommended protection action is to get below ground, um, while for a flash flood event, it's to get to higher ground. Um, furthermore, uh, when these TORF events occur, uh, thinking about uh, dimensions of social vulnerability and how those can further compound those protective decision-making processes. So thinking about whether or not an individual has um, the right access or resources to respond to one or both hazards. Um, so this is what we were really interested in looking at. Um, while recent research has looked at TORF events, looking at climatological conditions and operational challenges faced by uh, the NWS forecasters, uh, research has not yet looked at what members of the public um, experience. And so this is what we really wanted to focus on in this project. We also looked at climatological conditions, um, but I'll just be focused on the survey information in these uh, few minutes that we have. So we surveyed members of the public, 247. Um, we used, in terms of our methods, uh, we, were, uh, we used a Qualtrics survey. We were focused on two dates that happened last year on March 25th and 27th. Um, we had eight clusters of TORF events that happened in southeastern Arkansas, um, southern Tennessee, northern Mississippi, and northern Alabama. Um, we're also important to recommend or um, to point out is the study site where this happened. Uh, we also looked at vulnerability. Um, and when we compare uh, social vulnerability uh, to the rest of the United States, this area in particular, these areas had a higher average uh, percent of people living in poverty, were unemployed, age 65 and older, and had a disability. And uh, a of all of these factors, the highest were that we had a high percentage of individuals living in mobile and manufactured homes. Say a little bit about our methods then with our survey. Um, our research questions when we were trying to look at this behavioral response. So how do people, uh, when they get these dual warnings, how do they, uh, how are they motivated to seek protective action? Um, and so our research questions were really informed thinking about um, behavioral response models like protection motivation theory and protective action decision making model. And so we wanted to look at during these TORF events, how does hazard information shape then an individual's risk perception for both flash floods and tornadoes? And then how do those risk perceptions then influence their protective actions, both for flash floods and tornadoes? And to kind of look at this and um, um, figure this process out, we use structural equation modeling. We looked um, to examine the direct and indirect effects, again, between these different variables of receiving hazard warning information risk perception and protective action. And so here is a model of our preliminary findings um, and what we're working on right now and um, fleshing out. What we found was interesting. So ha having access to more hazard related information increased respondents tornado risk perception um, and flash flood risk perception. Um, the interesting though finding here was that um, while tornado risk perception was found to increase, increase both tornado protective action um, it was found in the same way to decrease flash flood protective action, um, while flash flood um, threat perception only increased flash flood protective action. Um, so in other words, what we're seeing here is that when people were aware of both threats, deciding what protective action to take could be complex. And it led to one um, threat, which was tornadoes being um, prioritized over the other threat. The other important thing to think about in this model is social vulnerability and how that can further um, compound decision making. And we're looking um, further at that, but in terms of just thinking about situations 
uh, particularly for, and I'll just move into the implications uh, section for time, um, but really thinking about socially vulnerable populations and considering what they're um, going through at the time, in particular mental, um, our mobile home residents um, who are the recommended protective action for them during tornadoes is to evacuate. And so to be thinking about, um, you know, giving in terms of protective actions um, for mobile home residents to think about um, routing then their evacuation plans to avoid flood prone areas was an important implication. Um, also increasing public awareness on TORF events. Um, so in terms of public outreach initiatives, coming up with more educational materials, especially for individuals who are living in TORF prone communities. Um, and then because we found in our findings that our results um, found that pub the public attended more to flash flood threats than tornado threats, um, that NWS um, weather forecast offices should ensure that they're not amplifying tornado threats more than flash flood threats. Um, and Jen Henderson and her colleagues have done a lot of work in this area. Um, and then um, finally, to avoid giving um, conflicting safety protocols um, and provide guidance on seeking protection for both threats. So some recommended um, messaging would be then, instead of having those conflicting get to higher ground, get to lower ground, messaging such as get to a storm shelter, shelter that's safe from flooding, or if you're driving to shelters, um, for someone, say, in a mobile home or manufactured home, know what roads are safe from flooding and do not attempt to drive through flooded roads. Um, and also emphasizing that roadside ditches aren't safe, especially uh, during heavy rainfall. So those are, that's um, a bit of our preliminary findings. Um, I just want to make sure that um, I get uh, below the seven minutes and just want to say thank you all so much for this opportunity. Um, there's a QR code if you're interested in reading the full report, you can see it there. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a wonderful presentation and we are doing great on time, everybody. So I'm very proud of you. Um, great way to set the pace for the rest of the meeting um, and really neat use of the QR code. I love that. Um, so next up we have, we'll be hearing from Erin um, Eldridge at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, who will be presenting on the March, 2020 Tennessee tornadoes, risk perceptions, preparedness and communication. So Erin, if you would like to share your screen, you can take it away. That look good? Okay. Um, so I'm Erin Eldridge, and I'm here with my colleagues Amanda Renke and uh, Jamie Lee Kim. And I'll be discussing um, our project on tornado risk perceptions, preparedness, and communication in Tennessee. And our project began in the months following a series of tornadoes that passed through Tennessee in early March 2020, which led to 25 deaths total and 19 of those were in Putnam County, which is east of Nashville. So this is primarily where we gathered data for the project to look at how experiences and beliefs influence decisions in tornado preparedness and processes and effects of hazard communication among various stakeholders. And we interviewed uh, 34 people, including survivors, emergency workers, volunteers, medical professionals, and other members of affected communities. And we also did a little bit of on-site field work when COVID rates permitted in uh, 2020 and in 2021. Uh, we also distributed a survey and got uh, 303 responses. And a lot of what we found supports uh, previous studies in the region in terms of how experience influences um, risk perceptions and preparedness, as well as barriers and challenges with warning systems. While some participants perceived tornado risk in the region to be low before and in even in some cases after the tornado event, uh, most survey responders, as well as many interviewees, reported increased preparedness after the 2020 event. Uh, many interviewees, especially those who were uh, directly affected in some way by the tornado event, expressed interest in purchasing a home with a basement, uh, installing a safe room, uh, and or buying a, a weather radio. In terms of uh, warnings, 
at least a quarter of uh, survey respondents noted that they did not receive any warning or alert. And interviewees often noted that uh, alerts came either moments before or immediately after the tornado event. In cases where there were no warnings uh, received, this may have been linked to damage to communication towers in the area that affected cell phone service. Most survey respondents reported relying heavily on cell phone apps uh, and text messages for weather warnings. Some individuals also shared that they frequently ignored app alerts uh, due to the um, volume generally received, uh, for example, frequent AMBER alerts. Uh, interviewees um, or interviews suggest that local emergency management agencies were well prepared to respond and uh, many interviewees discussed the effective response, which was perceived to be a result of the strong relationships built among agencies prior to the disaster, as well as the recent development of an emergency operations center in Putnam County, which facilitated uh, collaboration. Uh, there were also some improvised responses in the immediate aftermath, which proved useful, uh, particularly the use of the local PBS uh, television station, which is the only TV station in that immediate area, uh, as well as a Cookville Strong Facebook um, group. And both of these were used to communicate uh, with the public in the wake of the tornadoes. Um, some of the main takeaways uh, include the need for multiple and diverse forms of warning systems to communicate nocturnal threats uh, rather than uh, rely yeah. rather than so, uh, rather than reliance on cell phone apps alone uh, since the towers were damaged and also in many of the more rural areas, uh, there's limited reception generally. Uh, Putnam County recently wrote a grant uh, to purchase weather radios to disperse in the community, so that's a start. Um, our findings suggest a need for preparedness outreach uh, to co cultivate uh, an understanding of tornado behavior in the region and to combat uh, desensitization uh, to warning systems. Uh, like other areas of the Southeast, there is vulnerability among um, mobile home residents. In this particular event, however, uh, it was primarily fixed permanent homes that were destroyed, uh, especially where the EF4 tornado passed through the just flattened neighborhoods. Uh, so this suggests uh, a need for local and state governments uh, to explore funding for safe sheltering uh, possibilities, such as safe rooms for diverse housing types. Uh, also a need to review um, building codes with tor tornadoes in mind and incentivize uh, construction practices that at least mitigate damage or delay collapse uh, during storms and tornadoes. Um, and lastly, this study emphasizes the importance of strong relation relationships among entities involved in disaster preparedness and response, uh, such as emergency responders, media outlets, hospitals, nonprofits, and so on. And where possible, developing emergency operation centers that bring key stakeholders together during crises. And um, that's, that's all we have um, for today. So thanks. Thank you so much, Erin. And I see lots of comments coming in, which is just awesome. Um, I do ask a favor just so I can keep track of them so I can go turn back to those at the end. If it's a question, will you put Q and will you also put the name of the person the question's for just as they're coming in as the next person's presenting, it's hard to tell if you're talking about the previous presentation or the current one. So just put the person's name you want the comment or question to go to and just state if it's a question. If the comments, the authors can just read those. Um, so I'll turn it over now. Um, to Shengdai Gao from the University of Florida, who will be presenting on household targeted hurricane warnings for effective evacuation. And Shengdai, you can go ahead and share your slides. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen right now. So can everybody see my screen? That looks so, perfect. Yeah, thank you. So hello everyone. I'm Shengdai Gao, a PhD student from University of Florida. 
I represent my team to present our work regarding the household targeted hurricane warnings for evacuate uh, effective evacuation. So our team also uh, has the PI, Dr. Yan Wang, assistant professor, and also we get support from Northeastern University, Dr. Ran Chi Wang, assistant professor, and also the professor from University of Florida, Dr. Corey Matias, as a co-PI. So uh, our work is based on the context that claim, uh, climate change has made the destructive hurricanes more frequent and intense, making it critical to motivate protective measures such as uh, evacuation for the high risk areas. So we think uh, warnings, uh, just like the risk communication tools can help us to achieve this aim. However, the existing warning messages for the weather extremes are developed and disseminated for large spatial areas, just like a county or much larger areas. And this kind of the warning messages generally neglect the information related to the local environment. So I get a screenshot for the uh, previous Hurricane Irma, the warning, just like the cone of the hurricanes shows that the warning zones, it is a very broader area and it is not very relevant to specific individuals. So under this context, the high, high resolution, uh, like the building level geotargeted warnings that concerns just like the very fine scaled uh, spatial uh, environment information, can, can be a, just a solution to uh, solve these issues. So this is a, also this is a key message from the Hurricane Irma to show that very broad areas from existing general hurricane warnings. So we need a better solution for that. So uh, with this context and motivations, our work aims to answer the following research questions. Just like how can we improve the process of defining the geotargeted hurricane warning zones to consider not only just like the hazard factors like the wind speed, but also we consider the built environment characteristics like the land use or very fine scaled information. And also, we, after we design it, we need to evaluate whether this kind of the target warning information, warning messages can better motivate household to evacuate from the high risk areas before the hurricane uh, events. So uh, also I compare it, uh, we compare it with the uh, uh, current gen uh, general hurricane warnings to check whether it has a better performance on motivating the uh, evacuation and other uh, uh, pro uh, evacuation in this research. And also in the future work, we can check other uh, protective measures. Uh, so our methods, uh, just like uh, has this, this procedure. So we firstly design the target warning scenarios, just like how can we uh, de de determine the fine scale warning zones considering the wind speed, land use, and the flooding factor. The flooding factor represents the flooding risk of fine scale areas. And also the, uh, we evaluate the performance with uh, of such kind of the geo target warnings by modeling the virtual agents decision making process. We utilize the agent based modeling to simulate people's, uh, the household's decision making for the evacuation after receiving the hurricane risk messages. And also we compare the simulation outcomes with the real world mobility data. So we collect uh, uh, multiple sources, uh, data from multiple sources, like the wind speed, land use, flooding factors, and the social vulnerabilities. Then, uh, to determine the just like the risk levels for the geotactic hurricane warnings, we uh, just like comparing, uh, we just consider the wind, wind speed, fine scale wind speed, the land, land use, and also the fine scale uh, flooding risks in the local areas to generate the overall risk levels. Based on the, uh, just like the risk levels, we determine the uh, warning messages to the uh, just like the households. And in this research, we simulate people's just like receive this kind of the warning messages and how they make the decisions. We utilize the decision field theory, which is a basic theory for the agent-based modeling to model people's decision-making process. And it considers the previous decisions and also the risk messages they receive and also their social vulnerability level to determine their uh, decisions in the next step. 
Then we compared the simulation outcomes with the real-world mobility data. So we collected 758 real-world persons' mobility records and algorithm to represent the sensor block real-world evacuation rate. Just like uh, I just said that we can only simulate the virtual household's decision, not the actual people's decision. So we aggregated the simulation outcomes to the also to the sensor block level and then compare the sensor block evacuation rate under just like uh, the simulation scenarios and the real world scenarios. So this is uh, uh, just like the maps showing the uh, evacuation rate in each census block group uh, during the, just like after the warning is uh, disseminated for about one week. And we can see that this is a simulation uh, scenario that the evacuation rate in each census block, especially the high risk census blocks are gradually increased and also, we uh, put uh, mapping the real world mobility records to the sensor block level and show the evacuation rates. As you can see, that in some, uh, it is also increased, but just like in some areas, especially the high risk areas, uh, the evacuation rate is not very high as we expected. So we compare it with two maps showing the final, uh, just like final days of the evacuation rate. As the, Red box here shows the uh, high risk areas that just like have a higher level, the integrated higher level hurricane risks regarding the wind speed, land use, and flooding risks. And we can see that under the simulated evacuation, that virtual agents can receive the geo targeted hurricane warnings. These areas people can just like more, much better be motivated to conduct the evacuation than the real world evacuation rate. Also, as I will show the temporal change of the evacuation rate from the overall, just like consider all the sensor uh, blocks, and we can see that evacuation rate increased more rapidly under the geo targeted hurricane warnings with the building level risk assessment than the real world evacuation conditions. So, this is a preliminary study, and we just like have some ideas for the future works and the knowledge body. So, uh, the first is that. Uh, even for our future works under the knowledge body, we can just uh, in provide more integrated dynamic risk assessment with the finer scale information for human environment system and also the updating weather forecast. And also risk messages can be designed to become more tailored based on the people's locations of where uh, information and further improve the message uptakes of the individual's household. And also, we calls for the, the just like better understanding of the communication approach to evolve the uncertainty of the imminent weather and uh, climate hazard. Just like uh, under the future climate change scenarios, the weather extremes can just like have much more uncertainties regarding the frequency and the intensity, the affected areas. So this kind of the issues can should be considered and better understand and better understood in the future communication approaches. And also, we call for the bottom-up understanding of the evacuation decision-making process, just like we have a simple simulation or the modeling for the individual or household level uh, decision-making process, but uh, this process is much complex than our modeling and more just like detailed and just like accurate decision-making modeling should be considered when we just like consider people's uptake of the uh, hurricane risk messages across just like consider their social networks and the community's conditions. Just like this is our lab and thank you very much for listening to my presentation and we, we are welcome for the, for the questions and the communications. Thank you. Thank you, Shangde. Um, now I'd like to introduce you to Ashley Ross from Texas A&M University at Galveston, who will be presenting on learning from Hurricane Laura's near miss, evacuation decision-making under uncertainty. I forgot to unmute myself, I'm sorry. <laughs> Have everything else going now, right? Thank you so much for um, just, we're honored to be part of this cohort of really exciting weather ready research. And I am presenting today our project about um, how we can communicate better around near miss events 
using a real world event um, from uh, Texas. I'm presenting on behalf of my collaborator, Dr. David Retchless. We're both assistant professors here at Texas A&M University. And with that being said, I just want to give a shout out and thank you for this type of support because it gives us um, important funding sources to develop new and innovative research that we perhaps wouldn't be able to secure otherwise. So that being said, um, regarding our project, what our study is looking at is an interdisciplinary approach to explore hurricane evacuation under conditions of compounding climatic and social uncertainty. We all know that some storms have uncertain forecast tracks, making predictions and protective behaviors such as evacuation really difficult. And Hurricane Laura in August of 2020 presented such an uncertainty to the Houston Galveston region. Local authorities issued evacuation orders for many of the most vulnerable communities in the area, including Galveston Island. And ultimately the storm was a near miss event for Houston Galveston residents because it made landfall northeast of the area at Cameron, Louisiana. If we all recall and take a, a you know, trip back to September 2020, we know that there were also high social concerns at the time over the safety of evacuation due to COVID-19 pandemic. And additionally, at that stage of the pandemic, there was a lot of, because of politics, doubt in messages from scientists, government authorities, and experts. So, these conditions provided a unique context to answer, how do we effectively communicate extreme weather events under conditions of high uncertainty? To explore this, our study focuses on how framing and messaging and politics in pandemics affect hurricane evacuation. To study this evacuation behavior, we designed and launched an online survey of 850 residents of the Houston Galveston metro region the online survey drew on a quota based sample and was in the field from March 22nd to May 19th of 2021. The questionnaire included randomized messaging treatments to test for the effects of varied message source, type, and probability. In terms of methods um, to analyze the survey data and to explore the effects of framing and messaging, as well as the pandemic and politics, we ran correlations, regression analyses, as well as mediation tests. The dependent variable of hurricane evacuation intention was measured from vignette responses. The pre-test vignette referenced the real event of Hurricane Laura, as you can see in this wording here. And that's an innovation in the study of near-miss events. It also assigned a message source, which either was a friend or a weather forecaster. The post-test vignette introduced a type of message, so either the track or the strength of the storm, as well as gave a probability of impact. So it was either the same as the pre-test, uncertain, or double um, the impact of the pre-test. So regarding what we found in terms of the effects of framing and messaging on evacuation um, intentions, we found that near miss storms, um, do, it does matter what the framing is. So in the past, near miss storms have been studied as either being framed as vulnerable, which means the disaster almost happened but was narrowly avoided. So here we would expect more protective action or as resilient, meaning the disaster was successfully avoided. And so we would expect less protective action. For our study, we measured vulnerable through agreement with the statement that the Houston Galveston metro area was almost hit by Hurricane Laura. Um, the resilient framing was agreement with it was just luck that Hurricane Laura didn't hit the Houston Galveston metro area. So based on those measures, what we found is that the framing of near miss as more vulnerable was associated with a higher pretest probability of evacuating. And um, when we looked at this in terms of the full model, when we controlled for risk perceptions of Hurricane Laura, that effect was washed out but it still points to vulnerable framing as important. In terms of messaging, um, we found that risk message source and type did not affect evacuation intention. 
but um, the information about the probability of the impact did. So specifically saying that the storm was twice as likely to hit the area and or cause damages resulted in about a 7% higher probability of evacuating. Second, we explored the effects of concern for COVID-19, partisanship and trust in science. Regarding COVID-19, our cross tabulations revealed that COVID-19 concern was higher among those who evacuated than those who did not. Um, about 49% of those who evacuated were very concerned compared to 31% of those who did not. But it, this was not statistically significant in the full model when controlling for risk perceptions. Regarding political beliefs, there was no difference between evacuation intentions and behavior um, across party lines, and that was also not significant in modeling. And then finally, with trust in science, um, descriptively, we see a difference between those who evacuated and did not with higher confidence in science among those who evacuated. But again, that was not statistically significant when we controlled for risk perceptions. So taking all this together, the results have many implications for emergency managers and other hurricane risk communicators. First, our um, findings are consistent with prior research, so we should feel confident in applying the lessons from near miss literature. Specifically, that points to framing um, the near miss as vulnerable, so having this conversation about it was almost a disaster is really important. Second, we need to acknowledge concerns um, about, um, a, about compounding hazards. So what our research has shown is that there were concerns about COVID-19 and evacuation. So we need to address that and we need to consider these mental health burdens associated with simultaneous concern for multiple crises. And finally, uh, we need to consider how trust in science may affect recept um, reception of messages and willingness to engage in protective behavior. Our results um, actually highlight the need for more research in this area in relation to hurricane evacuation, but also in, with regards to information sources that we didn't quite get into in this project or in this presentation. So uh, lots of room for future research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, okay. So next I would like to introduce Jamie Vickery from the University of Washington and her team. Sadly, Jamie can't be here today, but she did pre-record her presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that for her. Um, please do note her email address if you have any direct questions that you would like to send to her team. I'm sure she'll answer those um, for you via email. Let me go ahead and share my screen now. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you so much again for joining us today. My name is Jamie Vickery and I'm a research scientist for the Collaborative on Extreme Event Resilience at the University of Washington and a social sciences specialist for the Neary Rapid Facility. For our presentation titled, Risk Communication Planning, Learning from Lived Experiences of Homelessness, I'll start by providing an overview of the study, including our research questions and qualitative data collection approach. As the study is ongoing, the findings I'll present are high level and preliminary. At this time, I'd also like to acknowledge my co-investigators shown here, including Drs. Nicole Errett and Ann Bostrom, as well as William Sweeney and Hanson Winlet, who also serve as key community partners for this research and as advocates for individuals experiencing homelessness. Thank you all for your continued time and contributions to this important work. Studies of homelessness and disaster, while growing, remain an under-examined area within disaster research. What scholarship has discovered, however, is that people experiencing homelessness encounter a range of issues when preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disaster. These are largely a result of, for instance, having limited access to shelter or resources to facilitate protective actions, systemic marginalization and socio-political exclusion, and policies or practices that effectively criminalize homelessness, such as encampment sweeps, camping bans, and citations for loitering or panhandling. Further, while prior research has demonstrated the need to tailor risk communication strategies and community engagement approaches to reach at-risk and marginalized populations, critical work remains to determine how, if at all, these individuals and communities, particularly those who are unhoused or precariously housed, are engaged and incorporated into emergency and risk communication planning and how they receive extreme weather risk information. 
key aims guiding this research, building on this gap, are to enhance understanding of how individuals experiencing homelessness are considered in emergency and risk communication planning, and how extreme weather risk communication is delivered to and received by these individuals. This study is geographically focused within Denver and Boulder counties, Colorado, given the prevalence of homelessness within this region, the hazard profile of the area, the contentious mm. history of the area's approaches to addressing homelessness, as well as extreme weather events that occurred just prior to and during the study period from 2020 to 2021, including poor air quality as a result of wildland fires, extreme temperatures, and winter weather. Before engaging in data collection, we worked with local community partners to begin communication with community members who would be willing to serve in a paid advisory capacity to inform the construction of interview questions, interpretation of findings, and dissemination strategies for the study's findings. The advisory team includes individuals all having experienced homelessness in the past and all having previously resided in or are currently residing or working in Boulder and Denver counties. At all points during the 2021 study period, we had four advisors comprising the advisory team. Our work is guided by four research questions shown here, but for today's presentation, I'm focusing primarily on research question three highlighted here concerning the strategies used to disseminate extreme weather risk information. I will also note recommendations for improving communication as shared by those who were experiencing homelessness at the time of this study. To answer our research questions, we reviewed state and county level emergency and risk communication plans and conducted in-depth semi-structured interviews with 29 individuals across three groups shown here. Today, I'll discuss three preliminary findings, beginning first with risk communication strategies used by HSOs, or homeless serving organizations, emergency managers, and local and county officials to inform people living unhoused about extreme weather threats, as well as how these individuals receive and identify extreme weather risk. The methods that HSO representatives reported using to reach unhoused individuals primarily include in-person notifications at the physical locations of their organizations. However, depending on the organizational structure, staff capacity, and mission, some HSOs conduct street outreach to those camping outside to communicate extreme weather risk and to provide supplies and resources for people to take protective action, such as hotel vouchers, tents, and sleeping bags. We found that among the organizations represented in this study, there are often no formal organizational plans for communicating risk to their clients. They instead use phone tree style notification systems to spread the word within and between organizations to reach individuals using these services and those living on the streets. Emergency manager and city and county agency interviewees shared similar strategies for communicating risk to unhoused and other difficult to reach communities by drawing upon networks and pre-existing relationships with homeless and social serving organizations. All referenced either their relationship with law enforcement or partnering with law enforcement to communicate extreme weather risks to individuals camping or residing outside, as well as using cell phone alert systems. However, they noted challenges with these approaches, which I'll highlight in an upcoming slide. A key finding across all individuals within this subgroup was the significance of partnerships and interorganizational coordination with agencies, organizations, and groups that work with unhoused or precariously housed members of the community in order to spread risk messaging. People experiencing homelessness represented in this study shared ways that they often received risk communication messaging, which primarily included word of mouth, environmental cues, automated or app-based alerts via cell phones for those who have access to cell phones or power sources, direct communication with staff at HSOs for those who use these services, and at what they referred to as feeds or areas where food distribution occurs. As part of the interview guide, we asked HSO representatives to share their knowledge or perception of whether homeless communities are carefully or deliberately considered in local and county emergency management and response plans in the event of extreme weather. A majority of interviewees in this subgroup responded that they feel these communities are not thought of at all or that they are considered an afterthought when an extreme weather event is impending or unfolding. A central challenge reported by HSO and emergency management interviewees for communicating extreme weather risk included how many individuals experiencing homelessness have limited to no access to a cell phone. Additionally, participants from all three interviewee groups noted that who communicates these messages plays an important role in how people receive and act upon risk information. For example, some explained a sense of distrust among unhoused individuals toward law enforcement, going back to an earlier point made about the negative effects of criminalization of homeless communities. In addition to logistical barriers for ensuring that a majority of unhoused individuals and communities are able to receive extreme weather risk information, 
A notable challenge shared by both city and county agency and HSO interviewees included the fact that many organizations reported not being able to provide viable alternatives or opportunities for these individuals to actually act upon risk. Some interviewees living unhoused explained challenges they had experienced in receiving and acting upon risk information in previous extreme weather events such as inconsistent or out-of-date information as to where to seek shelter or receiving information that they are unable to act upon to protect themselves. Nearly all individuals who were experiencing homelessness at the time of their interview shared recommendations for how HSOs, county and or local government agencies could communicate and plan for the needs of homeless and precariously housed communities leading up to and during extreme weather. They offered a range of suggestions, although many of them centered around needing additional and multiple modes of communication for effectively receiving information about weather risks, such as using loudspeakers, LED signs, or digital signage, like those used in construction areas, for instance. Some also referenced the need for additional spaces and options for sheltering, not necessarily traditional emergency shelters, but provision of tents and supplies, as well as providing people with access to housing or resources they could use to act upon risks, and increased coordination across service providers. In terms of providing adequate and additional sheltering options, some shared the need to make sure that these spaces are inclusive of the needs of individuals, such as those with pets and those needing secure storage options, and that they are treated with dignity. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals and entities who are absolutely instrumental in this work. And I thank you all and welcome any questions that you may have. Okay, and we'll add um, Jamie's email address to the comment box as well if people would like to email her directly. And I would just like to thank her and her entire team for this really important research. Um, and so next we have, I'm pleased to introduce Na Yu from the University of Texas at Austin, who will be presenting on the role of 360 degree videos in wildfire preparedness. Na, feel free to share your screen. Can you see my screen right now? Yep, it's not in slideshow mode yet. Okay. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. My name is Nai. I'm a PhD candidate of the University of Texas at Austin. And this study was conducted by me and Dr. Lucy Atkinson, who is a associate professor from the University of Texas at Austin. And our research topic is to investigate the role of 360 degree videos in welfare preparedness. So due to climate change, wildfires have become more intense and more frequent, particularly in parts of the Western US. The 360 degree videos have been regarded as effective tools in affecting public attitudes and behaviors. So our study aimed to investigate how 360 degree videos affected the public welfare preparedness. In terms of research, a model. Our study draws from the risk information seeking the processing model and the theories of immersive media. So this is our research model. And uh, our first hypothesis, we hypothesize that 360 degree videos will increase participants' sense of spatial presence. And the second set of hypotheses, we hypothesize that 360 degree videos will influence participants' negative effect through sense of spatial presence. And such negative effect will positively related to information seeking behaviors. And our third set of hypotheses, we hypothesize that 360 degree videos will influence participants' issue involvement through sense of spatial presence. And such issue involvement will positively relate to information seeking behaviors regarding wildfires. And our fourth set of hypotheses, we hypothesize that 360 zero degree videos will influence individuals' welfare risk perceptions through sense of spatial presence. And the such risk perceptions will positively relate to information seeking behaviors. In order to examine our hypothesis, we, our study employed a between subjects online experiment. So there are 400, 400 US adults to join our online survey. And though those 400 participants were randomly assigned into two conditions. 
In condition one, 200 participants were asked to watch 360 degree videos. So in condition one, participants can interact with the videos. They can control the directions of the videos. And in condition two, 200 participants were asked to watch unidirectional videos, aka traditional videos. So participants, they cannot control the videos. They cannot change the direction of the videos. And the video content in both conditions are similar. So the only difference is that in condition one, participants can interact with the videos, while in condition two, they cannot. And here are our preliminary findings. According to the mediation analysis, our study found that the sense of spatial presence has played a crucial role in affecting individuals' negative effect, issue involvement, and perceived welfare risks. Our study also found that negative emotions, such as sad, scared, anxious, motivated the participants to seek information regarding welfare. Our study also found that individuals' risk perceptions influence their information seeking behaviors. And lastly, our study found that issue involvement was positively related to information seeking behaviors regarding welfare. Here are three main takeaway implications. So our first implication, our study suggests that welfare information would be better presented with visual displays, such as 360 degree videos. In this way, audiences attention can be attracted quickly. And our second suggestion is for risk communicators. We suggest when risk communicators design messages, they could use content components which can trigger viewers negative emotions. So those negative emotions can make the audiences feel the welfare issue is relevant and important. And in this way, they will be more likely to seek welfare information. And our third implication is that we found that using 360 zero degree videos to deliver welfare information can make the general public make the wildly risk assessments. And such Widely, the risk assessments is very important when participants get ready for the uh, get ready for the potential welfare risks. So in this way, they will know when the risk come and whether this risk is relevant and important for them. So that's our study, and thank you for listening or watching. Thank you, Na. Okay, next up we have uh, Katrin Edgley from Northern Arizona University presenting on burned area emergency response during southwestern monsoon season. Oh, thanks. I so, think um, I. Uh, you have to stop sharing your screen first. Thank you. Perfect. Your screen, no slides. How's that? Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to talk today on behalf of our team. We're half School of Forestry at Northern Arizona uh, and then a collaborator from the Forest Service uh, on our work looking at burned area emergency response teams and how they operate under monsoon season conditions in the southwest, so Arizona and New Mexico. I thought a good place to start would be what are bear teams? Uh, Vern Area Emergency Response, they are essentially teams of federal employees who are experts in different aspects of post-fire recovery. It could be hydrology, ecology, uh, wildlife. They come together in burn landscapes to assess the conditions, how severe the, uh, what, what was the burn severity, uh, how has the hydrology changed, different bits and pieces like that. And then they make recommendations specifically for emergency restabilization. Usually this happens on any fire that's over 500 acres. This is really, really important for us in the Southwest because we do have a monsoon season when fire burns in an area, it creates a high hydrophobicity on the soil. So we're getting a lot more runoff uh, that can lead to increased flood risk, um, mudslide risk, uh, debris flows, all of that kind of stuff and much more heightened. And a lot of the time fires are happening near developed areas. That's a big safety um, issue for the public. The other challenge with this is fair teams can only operate on federal land. We know that the risk doesn't stop at that boundary, 
Uh, so what's going on on the other side is a big question. Right now, to the best of our knowledge, there isn't any social research on their teams. So we decided that our study would kind of start with the behind the scenes of communication. What is going on? How do they come together uh, and plan to inform whether ready responses for the public? This is something of a pilot study. So right now we have 21 interviews, hoping to continue that into the summer or fall. So far we talked with Bear Team leads, uh, team members, and folks who are not affiliated with Bear Teams and non-federal organizations, but have intersected with their work before. We identified them using this great database that the Forest Service has. It has every burned area emergency response team published there. We went in there to look for contacts and then snowballed out from there. Most of our interviews were around an hour long. We're partway through that coding process in qualitative data analysis program and vivo right now. So we found all kinds of stuff. This is just a, a little bit of cherry picking here. One of the bigger challenges behind the scenes is that bare team expertise is aging out essentially. Folks we interviewed were either doing this for 30, uh, 20 or 30 years already or less than three years. There weren't many people in between. As those older folks retire out or um, move along, uh, those younger folks are kind of pushed into the situation where they're taking on a lot of responsibility without any training. So they're already moving into communicating and making plans for weather ready response without a, um, a full background in it yet. That led to uh, a hesitancy to respond in their teams or um, uh, volunteer to work on them. So we were often seeing a lot of interest in pulling in out of region. So folks outside of Arizona and New Mexico, uh, other areas of, from the Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, uh, National Park Service, coming into detail on our fires. But the challenge with that is they're not familiar with our monsoon seasons. So there was less trust in models, less uh, incorporation of local knowledge into those conversations. There's also a lot of loyalty to different hydrological models across the folks we interviewed. And it tended to be, what did your mentor or your person who trained you informally use? And did you learn that from them? Or what did you learn in college? And that's the thing you stick with. But there is a huge suite of hydrological modeling for planning uh, potential flood events. Um, so seeing why people are doing some things or using other models um, is something that needs more investigation, I think. As far as the non-federal federal, federal uh, partnership working across boundaries, really didn't happen often. And that was a missed opportunity for communication, I think. Where it did happen, it's really informal and it depends on who's on the bear team and whether they're willing to put that time aside to communicate to non-federal partners. Uh, there's no incentive for them to do it right now. That led to a lot of these non-federal partners in the interviews expressing frustration, um, not knowing what's going on on the other side. And then it makes it really difficult for them to become weather ready and communicate to the public because they don't have access to the models and all the resources that the federal uh, team has. Uh, one overarching theme of this as well was public understanding of bear teams is really, really limited. And a lot of folks who are on bear teams are communicating with the public for the first time during a public meeting. So they get up on the stage, they have no training in how to communicate. So they just really focus on uncertainty of the models and being transparent in those conversations. Lots of implications from this. Um, the big one I think we took away from this is there's a really big need for formalized training across the federal agencies for their team members. Right now they're getting informal mentoring from maybe the person who retiring and they're taking the position of. Um, but there's a lot of conversation about in the fire world, there are task books and you work through a series of, um, uh, of tasks to get a qualification. They really want that for burned area emergency response, including uh, a qualification around public communication. So when they get up on that stage at a public meeting, um, they, they know what to say. Uh, Barrett teams are very rarely assigned public information officers, so it falls to them to do that communication. There's also a need to incentivize bear team participation. Right now, it's a bonus. Well, I shouldn't say a bonus. It's an additional responsibility outside of the position. You volunteer for it. There's no hazard pay. Uh, so why would the younger generation volunteer to do this work when they already have a full load? 
workshops and trainings um, on different models and their strengths are really needed within the federal agencies right now so that they can start to pass out some of the strengths and weaknesses when one model might be right uh, or better than another one um, so that we can get some diversity going or play into the strengths of them. And the best way we saw folks uh, building non-federal partnerships was when they expanded their modeling work beyond their federal boundaries. So maybe instead of just doing the national forest, they'd pull it out into the city as well, share that information, and then they were able to coordinate mitigation efforts for post-fire flooding. And they found it really, really useful for de developing um, early warning systems uh, for unusual or extreme precipitation events that could then be communicated back to the public too. The last big recommendation we had was there's a really big interest in some kind of strategic document from the federal government outlining their approaches to climate change. Folks know monsoon season is changing a lot already. Uh, fire season has certainly changed. They want to know how to communicate to that to the public and what that means for their job moving forward. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kat. Um, okay, uh, now I would like to introduce uh, Rowie Kirby Stryker from the Wake Forest University, who will be presenting on connecting flooding, storm, and hurricane experiences to risk perception and preparedness behavior. Nice. The slides are up, so it looks great. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much um, to the Natural Hazard Center for this opportunity and for uh, the award. In November 2020, when we were all coming to grips with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, Hurricane Ada uh, barreled through uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, made its way to the US, dumped up to 12 inches of rain in some parts of North Carolina, leading to uh, just extreme devastation a lot of inf infrastructure damage, but sadly also loss of life. And um, around, that, around the same time, I was teaching a risk communication course and my students and I were talking about how we can blend the technical approach to risk communication and bring it with the cultural approach to risk communication. And so I, spoke to my colleague, Leslie Straker from Longwood University. And after we saw this opportunity, we decided to conduct a study. And we really wanted to connect um, flooding experience, experiences with storms, with risk perception, emotion, and preparedness behavior, among other variables, which I'll mention later on. And so, we really wanted to explore how experiences and especially through storytelling already circulating in communities could be leveraged for enhanced disaster preparedness. And we thought about doing this using a mixed methods approach with three, three um, parts to the study. So the first one would be a quantitative survey. It actually was a quantitative survey, quantitative <coughs> survey and interviews, we wanted to follow up those with interviews and at the same time conduct a, a content analysis on media messages that were circulating around the time of, of Tropical Storm Ada. And we were a bit too, a bit too ambitious. And so, so far, we have only completed the quantitative survey and partially the um, content analysis. We do plan to follow up with the interviews. And so this presentation is just to share with you some preliminary analyses of that survey. We got uh, 312 participants, and this was conducted a little later than we would like. There were some delays due to um, COVID and, and other issues. Most of the participants came from Wake County. So Raleigh, if you know Raleigh, it's part of Wake County. And next, uh, the next most people we had um, also were from uh, Mecklenburg County. And if you know Charlotte, Charlotte is a part of that county. And then Alexander County, which is a really small county, we didn't get as many people as we would have liked, which 
which is a bit reg regrettable because Alexander County had five deaths um, that occurred at a campground due to flooding. Not such a great sample. This was done through Qualtrics um, Research Services and there it was overwhelmingly female, which can be a problem for generalizing across genders. But our main research question was, what is the relationship between um, experience with these disasters, perceived susceptibility and severity, which measure risk perception, personal relevance, self-efficacy, place attachment, which has some emotion in it, but we also looked at discrete emotions of fear and worry. And looking really quickly at this table of correlations between the variables, um, you'll see some pretty big correlations. So anything over 0.5 as a correlation is considered a large correlation. Between 0.3 and 0.5 could be on the plus or minus side uh, is considered moderate. So we had some um, pretty large correlations. If you notice between personal relevance and susceptibility, perceived susceptibility to flood, also between experience with loss and fear, um, worry and place attachment, this is approaching five. And if you notice here, if, if you think about storytelling, these are some variables that would be important for storytelling, emotion variables. So what we found in our, some of our preliminary findings, we're still doing more data analysis, is that personal relevance really played a partial mediating role between some of these variables and perceived susceptibility. And um, for example, here, you could see that the effect of experience on perceived susceptibility uh, is reduced when personal relevance is in this model, this mediating model, we use the Kenny method. See, it goes down from 0.73 here to 0.34. We found a similar uh, relationship when it came to place attachment and perceived susceptibility. So personal relevance is explaining uh, some of the variance, a, a good bit of the variance between these variables. Same thing with fear and perceived susceptibility and with worry. And so the implications of this, these findings are that personal relevance should be leveraged in risk communication, particularly any that communication that's designed to increase perceived susceptibility. The extent to which perceived susceptibility then engenders disaster preparedness behaviors, and we need to study that as well. We have some data. It's not as significant as we thought. Uh, so this is very clear to us that personal relevance it should be looked at more and that there may be a role for it in storytelling to enhance the effect of experience and vicarious experience, retelling these stories, sad though they may be, to uh, engender better disaster preparedness. I think my time might be up, but our next steps are to follow up with the interviews starting in Alexander County. And we would really like to do some structural equation modeling to look at the relationships between several variables at once beyond the mediating models. And also we'd like to then look at the, um, well, yes, I think this is not just for us, it's for other people too, to look at the utility of susceptibility, um, perceived susceptibility in predicting actions to save lives. Thank you kindly. Thank you, Rowie. Um, and last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Haley Murphy from Oklahoma State University, who will be presenting on risk messaging during syndemics, Hurricane Laura and COVID-19. And I see your slides are already up here. Uh, do you want to put those in presentation mode? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Well, I'm actually filling in for Lauren Clay today a little bit, which um, may not be so great for you. She's actually a great presenter, so I think you would have enjoyed it. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about research that uh, we've conducted with uh, Dr. Alex Greer and Tristan Wu, who are here today as well. So you should direct all your questions to them. <laughs> Just kidding. 
Um, so the background for our study is we were really focused on risk communication and protective actions. Um, our research that we have available on risk communications when we have just a single hazard um, is that people prefer graphic communication and categorical risk ratings for making their protective action decisions. Um, and then on protective actions for single hazards, people tend to, in, in hurricane, tornado situations, people tend to prefer evacuation and sheltering with friends and, fami and families, maybe hotels with public shelters as a last resort. What we don't know as much about is how people prefer to get their information about um, multiple hazards that are occurring at the same time and what their protective action behaviors are. And so we had the COVID-19 pandemic we're still going through. And um, the difference in evacuation behavior for a hurricane season when there's not a pandemic and a pandemic was a question that we were very interested in. Um, what we know about COVID-19 and particularly in September of 2020 is that transmission rate was highest when people gathered indoors and for a sustained duration, which is exactly the kind of um, behavior you would have during a hurricane evacuation scenario with public sheltering. And so the question that we have is, how do we make sense of this in a dual hazard when we have separate um, evacuation um, hazard adjustment advice or hazard adjustment information and very, very different hazard adjustment information for a pandemic. And we use syndemic theory to study this. Syndemic theory uh, really helps us to explain the very complex relationships between um, hazards, natural and technological, and when people are exposed to those hazards and the social conditions that are also going on at the time and how we can understand people's decision-making and response to that. So our research questions were what hurricane and pandemic risk information sources do emergency managers rely on? How do emergency managers distribute hurricane and pandemic risk information to the public, especially when it's conflicting? And then what communication strategies were perceived as most effective during this multi-hazard event? Our methods, we actually were building on a National Science Foundation rapid grant uh, that was two-pronged. So we did uh, interviews with emergency managers and we did a disproportionate stratis stratified household survey sample of people who lived in evacuation zones during Hurricane Laura in, in uh, 2020. And so we actually had um, two counties in Texas and parts of two parishes in Louisiana that had mandatory evacuation areas that we did mail-based surveys. And then we had voluntary evacuation areas for the remainder of Galveston County, Texas, and um, some areas of Vermilion Parish in Louisiana with mandatory so that we could do um, analysis between those two types of evacuations. Um, this specifically, this allowed us to add on interviews with public information officers and other health communication professionals. Um, and that's the information we're gonna talk about today. This was the qualitative side of this research project. So in preliminary findings, when we talked about information sources with emergency managers, we found out that with the COVID-19 pandemic, not surprisingly, they, they primarily got their information from the CDC and local public health agencies. And uh, they also did this for hurricane information with the National Weather Service and local meteorologists. And what we found with particularly Hurricane Laura, was that they sought out information from trusted advisors, people that they already had relationships with in regional National Weather Service offices and in, in with local meteorologists that they had developed relationships with over time, which was not necessarily what happened with the pandemic, um, primarily because the pandemic is something that was still fresh. Um, they hadn't developed relationships with regards to pandemic information gathering, whereas hurricanes in Texas and Louisiana are an annual occurrence. Um, emergency managers relied on guidance from the C CDC for COVID precautions when it came to evacuation and sheltering, but they were also bound by guidance from state level agencies, and that was particularly true when it came to things like busing evacuees, um, and how they were going to get information about where people should meet and what COVID precautions they should take on buses and what they should have with them versus what was available in a time when PPE um, was still somewhat hard to get hands on. And then uh, also on congregate versus non-congregate sheltering, interestingly, um, 
when we spoke to higher level decision makers at the state level or in some larger nonprofit organizations, what we heard was they had moved to the decision to do non-congregate sheltering for evacuation kind of early in the year, as soon as we started talking about hurricane preparedness. But local emergency managers did not get that message. Um, they, their perception was that they didn't know that we were moving from congregate to non-congregate sheltering until uh, just a few days, a handful of days before the hurricane hit and had to shift all of their planning kind of last minute. Um, when it came to communication channels to the public, emergency managers prior to Hurricane Laura used a diverse set of um, uh, communication channels. So they relied a lot on social media. It was often the first thing they mentioned to us, but also uh, mass telephone or text messaging systems to get the information out with regard to evacuations and then local television and radio. But Hurricane Laura disrupted communication channels in areas that were hardest hit, particularly in Louisiana. And that required emergency managers to shift to a very flexible way of communicating with the public. And some of them uh, in their flexibility got very creative. Um, some printed out and hand delivered informational flyers in uh, neighborhoods within their cities and communities because that was the easiest way to get information when they didn't have access to um, electricity or other forms of uh, electronic communication. And also within shelters uh, where their citizens were living um, in non-congregate uh, hotels, non-congregate based shelters, and then reaching out to um, contacts in host cities that were with local media so that they could provide information about reentry and sheltering and when it was safe to come back through local media in cities outside of not only their own city, but sometimes outside of the state, um, because many evacuees uh, left Louisiana and went to Texas. And then when it came to perceptions of communication, we asked about uh, misinformation or disinformation in the public. And most of the emergency managers said they didn't hear a whole lot about that. They were sure it was kind of out there, but it didn't make it back to them. But the major issue was communicating risk trade-offs. So sheltering, even non-congregate sheltering might spread COVID-19, but the risk of death was less for that than it was for uh, it was less for evacuation and spreading COVID-19 than it was for staying put for the actual hurricane. And so we got a lot of statements along the lines of, I can treat COVID, I can't treat drowning. So I need people to leave, even if they're at a high risk for contracting COVID. Um, but most of the emergency managers still believed that their evacuation rates were much lower than they've been in the past. And they attributed much of that to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, interestingly, in areas um, six weeks later, Hurricane Delta hit, um, came along a similar path, um, but uh, many of the emergency managers had kind of the opposite reaction to it. The impacts were going to be less, and so they felt like staying in place made more sense so that you weren't um, at risk for a higher transmission of COVID. So just a few implications. Um, compounding disasters are increasing, and Texas and Louisiana had, depending on where you were at, had three or four hurricanes. Um, flooding the COVID-19 pandemic and also a major entrenched ice storm that was really historic in nature all within a one year period. Um, and so these things are um, increasing. And so emergency managers really need clear information sources and guidance on how to communicate conflicting hazard adjustments to the public. So in a way that gets a point across, or gets across the point of um, hazard adjustments, um, but in a way that keeps people the safest. Um, that requires good risk assessment and analysis training for emergency managers, which if you're teaching in an emergency management program, we kind of have access to those future emergency managers and can do that. But we know that most emergency managers at the local level don't have emergency management education. And so we need to find better ways to, to educate them on managing risk trade-offs. And then relationship building. It's imperative for non-congregate sheltering. And there, I, I, I think that we and many of the emergency managers have talked that we've talked to feel like that may be more common in the future, non-congregate sheltering. It was easier during Hurricane Laura though, when hotels were really suffering. They needed people to come into hotels. Um, and you know, 2021, we didn't have a lot of non-congregate sheltering needs in hurricane season, but many of the emergency managers were worried what that would look like as people had started traveling and staying in hotels again and hotels weren't really hurting for the business anymore. And so all of those relationships truly need to be built beforehand in order to keep communication lines open. So thank you.
Thank you, Haley. That is wonderful. And I know we only have four minutes left, so we're not going to be able to address all of these comments and questions. But like Lori said, we will have the chat box, um, all of that information posted back with the webinar online um, and available if people want to ask or answer questions directly. But in the few minutes that we do have, first, I want to plug the fact that we have our special wet tornado weather ready research call open right now. It runs through October of 2022, and it's going. To, we're going to be accepting proposals on an ongoing basis. So if you haven't seen that special call, please visit our website and learn more about our tornado ready research um, special call. And now I'm gonna to try to just go through my list of people and ask one question per person that I have. And thank you for everybody who's already answered in the chat box. Um, and let's just see how many we can get through. Okay, so first for Jennifer, a question, a similar question from Lori and Castle was, can you share with us more about how your team defined vulnerable populations in this study, such as housing status being one that seemed very important? Yes, great, thank you. And sorry for missing some of the questions. I did my best. Um, that was a really good question. And actually, uh, Stephen Strader uh, did the vulnerability analysis. He So I'll speak on what I uh, know, um, but he did. He used the CDC SVI. Um, so he created uh, looking at, um, and I believe it's in the report, all of the different areas. Um, but the main piece, again, from the social vulnerability that we found, we kind of highlighted in the report, um, when we compared those to the US population, um, higher rates of social vulnerability, but the main one that was the highest was um, a, such a high uh, percentage for uh, mobile home and manufactured homes in the areas that we were looking. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, next question is for Erin. Um, and this question is from Jessica Austin. She said, I also wonder if the team has stats on the number of fatalities from flooding versus tornadoes during TORF events, especially for vulnerable populations. A few key examples are very salient in our community where people sheltered from tornadoes and then drowned, but I don't know how pervasive that is and which hazard might be a more impactful hazard for those populations when both warnings are present. Uh, I, I don't think this was for our was that the under the wrong? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. I'm going to jump to the next question then uh, for you, Erin, <laughs> which is um, from Lori Peak, and she said, "Yeah, that's for you." Okay, I'm with Jessica and wondered what recommendations you have for cutting through the noise, since so many people seem to be ignoring the alerts. How can NOAA and other agencies ensure that the life-saving messages actually reach people? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I unfortunately don't have an answer for addressing, you know, the alert overload on cell phones, but uh, but previous studies have recommended uh, using multiple forms of warning, so not just cell phones alone, um, especially with nocturnal tornadoes. So finding ways to to get people up uh, and alert uh, in the middle of the night. Um, but yeah, I don't know about. Uh, you know, how to improve the cell phone uh, apps. So unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, so we are right at time. Lori, did you want to do a closing since we have one minute? You know, just a Jennifer, thank you so much to you and the entire Natural Hazard Center team for all of the behind the scenes work that went into making this possible. So huge round of applause, tremendous thanks to Gina and Castle and Kim from NOAA who joined us today and we're fully engaged and we're fully going to expect that this cohort of round one weather ready researchers that we continue to work on making these connections between the research and NOAA to make sure that there, there really is this research to operations that NOAA is so committed to. So tremendous thanks to our partners at NOAA for being here, to the presenters, each of you, really, really the findings you highlighted and the implications are absolutely crucial. And finally, to the audience that's with us, we do hope you will go check out these reports that are online and um, continue to uh, support this program. We hope you're gonna apply to future calls. And our next webinar in this series is going to focus on data instruments and other materials that have been published through this program. And so with that, we're at time. We send enormous gratitude to all of you, and we will be posting this recording and the chat uh, up on the Natural Hazard Center website. So with that, everybody, please take care of yourself and those around you. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care. Thank you.